Now, are you thinking of having a new boiler installed in 2023? And you're thinking to yourself, money's tight, so I'm gonna take the cheapest quote I can get. Well, hopefully that's not your mindset because actually picking the cheapest quote could actually cost you more in the long run. So what I'm gonna do in this video is I'm gonna show the full procedure of what gas engineers have to go through now to actually install a new combi boiler into somebody's house. Once you've watched the video, hopefully you will see all the stuff what needs to go into installing this boiler. And if your engineer hasn't done all these tests, and all these procedures, then is he ripping you off or not? Or her ripping you off or not? Anyway, let's get on with this video and let's find out exactly what needs to be done and whether you're getting value for money or not when you're having a new boiler fitted in 2023. Now, the first thing that can actually influence what you're paying is the price of the boiler. There's boilers out there at 500 quid and there's boilers out there at 2,000 pounds. So straight away, you could have a 1,500 pound difference there. And it all depends on the warranty you're getting as well. So there are some boilers out there who'll only give you a two year warranty and some boilers out there will give you a 12 year warranty. So these are the things you've got to weigh up to see whether you are getting value for money. Now, the first test gas engineers are always gonna carry out, hopefully, is a safe to touch test. So what's that then? We're gonna prove whether this is working or not. Before I touch my gas meter and my gas pipe, what I need to do is I need to go to a known socket or a known supplier that is working to be able to test my non-contact voltage indicator. This is a socket and C detector, which will tell me whether this plug socket is wired correctly and whether it's got an earth. So it does earth loop impedance tests, it does polarity and continuity. It will give me nice green flashing lights to tell me whether everything's okay. If we plug it into the plug socket and turn it on, it's got three nice green lights and it's now gonna do the earth impedance. It, it's got an earth as well. So I now know this is wired right. It's turned off at the moment. This is turned on as you can see, I'll turn the power on and I'll go to my live. So look at that, it's telling me that's the live. If I go to the neutral, it's giving me low beeps and if I go to the earth, it's giving me low beeps. But if I go to the live, it's giving me a red flashy light and it's indicating that that's live. So I can now go to my meter and I can test to see whether I've got any voltage going through my meter before I do my tightness test. But before I do put my sticky little fingers on anything, I need to prove it's still working. So now it's safe to touch the gas supply and the gas meter and the appliances. All gas engineers now need to do is carry out a tightness test on the gas to check and make sure before they start work, there's no gas leaks. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I've isolated the gas supply I'm now just going to remove the test nipple. Now, as always, on a tightness test, the first thing I'm going to do is a let-by test to see whether the ECV is letting by. And you can do this between 7 and 10. And you can see I've done it at 9.37 millibars. So you have between 7 and 10 millibars for one minute. You can see it's gone up by 0 0.04 millibars. So that's passed. Next I'm going to do is temperature stabilisation. And you can see I'm doing this at 20.15. So I have between 20 and 21 millibars to do this. And again, it's a one minute test. So we're just seeing whether or not it rises or falls. And it can do whatever it wants. It can rise or fall. So you can see now at the end of this stabilisation period, it's just gone to 0.04. We can now do a tightness test. So the tightness test, I'm doing it at 20.21. It's a two minute test. And at the end of this two minute test, it will tell me whether it's successful or not. And it's passed. That's a successful tightness test completed. What it says for me to do now is I can create report. 
So let's create the report, print it off. We've got a copy to prove it's passed the tightness test. Now we've safely isolated the gas supply and tested that to make sure there's no leaks. And we also need to make sure we safely isolate the electrical supply going to the boiler and the controls because we don't want to be dead. So first thing we need to do is prove with the proving unit. So you can see that's working. Now, first thing I want to test is because the plug is dis completely disconnected, there's no earth going from the socket because if this was a few spur, the earth would still be connected. So I just need to make sure that our earth connection is actually an earth connection and it's there because it could be picking up the earth from somewhere else. So if I go on the earth connection and then onto the switch there, we've got continuity. So you can see that that earth actually is connected. So first thing we need to do is go onto the earth wire. So we've got our main earth coming in here. Then we need to go to our live, which you can see we've got no voltage whatsoever. We can now go between live and neutral and we've got no voltage there. And now we can go between earth and neutral, no voltage there. And also we need to test now between earth and the external controls. Now you can see they are linked, so they should have no power on them. But this is where a lot of um, engineers get electrocuted is because a lot of electricians are wiring another supply into the controls from somewhere else and it'll be coming back on the switch live wire so that's where guys are getting electrocuted so this is why this is so important to test it correctly so onto the earth test across and you can see they're dead once we've done that just to prove that this is still working we need to go back onto our proving unit so now prove that's still working so now we can assume this is completely dead we also need to isolate the power to the uh, supply to the boiler and we also need to retain the fuse so nobody accidentally turns the power back on while we're working on the system now next we need to drain the system down and we need to check the water quality that we're actually taking out of the system to see whether we need to power flush or magna cleanse or just use a cold flush with chemicals so we need to get a container and we need to open one of the drains at the bottom of the rad. You could actually do it from the bleed point at the top of the radiator if you wanted to. But you need to take a sample. Now the first bit is, we don't want that bit. So we need to empty that out, clean out the tray because we don't want it contaminating. And we need to take another sample. So it's not the first bit we use, it's the second sample we take. So once we've cleaned the tray out, we can now take our sample water. Now we don't need a lot but uh, it's always better if the heating system is warm when we do this as well. So we can uh, use our test strips or chemicals if we needed to check whether there was in any inhibitor in the system or not. So that's the first thing we need to do is collect a sample. So the way this stability tube works if we can see it nice and clear like that it says we're done. If it's like that number two it says we need to use F1 and we're done. So if it looks like that, we need to do that. And if it looks like that, we need to do that. So this is looking down the turbidity tube with a nice clean system. So you can see the rings down at the bottom very, very clearly. So we know if we see this, no problems with this central heating system whatsoever and we wouldn't need to magna cleanse it or power flush it. If we swap the two turbidity tubes, you can see this one is the dirty one and we can't see any of the rings down at the bottom of the turbidity tube. So straight away with this, we will be saying it would need a flush system, whether it were magna cleansing it or whether we were power flushing it. Even a chemical clean would not clean the water in this system. So even with me dropping the water down on the tube lower and we look down at the top, you can still not see the rings at the bottom. We would definitely be power flushing or magna cleansing this dirty heating system. Now after we've decided the system needs power flushing or magna cleansing, the first thing we'll need to do is actually drain the heating system. 
So I've connected a hose pipe to the lowest drain on the system, which just happens to be right near the front door. And I've run the hose pipe to the grid to drain the system. Next, I need to make sure that all the thermostatic and lock shield radiator valves are open and then open the bleed valves to every radiator on the system, starting upstairs, so we can completely drain the system of any dirty water. So if I was going to use a power flush machine on this system, so I've sheeted up in front of this radiator and I'm going to need to remove it. So the first thing I do is make sure there's no water left in this radiator before I remove it. So I'm just opening the vent to make sure it's completely drained because this is the lowest part of the system. So I'm using these water pump pliers and adjustable spanner to undo the nut holding the radiator to the valve. So holding against I can undo the nut making sure that there's a bowl underneath to catch any residual water so it doesn't go all over the carpet and I need to do this on both sides now both the flow and the return valves are undone I can just lift off the radiator and uh, get it out of the way so I can connect on the power flushing machine now the radiator has been removed I can now connect the power flush machine actually to the flow and return pipes making sure the valves are open and I've tightened on all the different hoses to the right connections on the machine itself. Also running a hose pipe to the drain outside. So that's how you connect up the power flush machine. Now if I was going to use the MagnaCleanse machine, the first thing I'd want to do would be install the MagnaClean filter. So I'd have to make any alterations to pipe work to be able to allow me to install the filter itself. Now the valve set has been installed actually into the pipework on the return to the boiler, I can now connect up the MagnaCleanse machine. Now everything comes with this machine to connect up the hoses, um, the valves and the adapter which will connect onto the actual MagnaCleanse itself. So if we just follow these hoses here, you can see exactly how I've connected it up to the existing valve set in the pipework. So on this connection will flow back to the magna cleanse machine and this will flow back into the system. Now this is the cleaner and this is the inhibitor. We're going to be putting the cleaner in first and then the inhibitor later. So the way we're going to put this cleaner in is through one of the magnets pots. So this is the magnet which is going to be catching all the debris. So I'm just going to get this full bottle and I'm going to pour it straight into the uh, magnet pot. So I've isolated the two valves which feed the MagnaCleanse machine and I've pre-filled the system because I've checked for leaks. So we're going to put all this chemical into this pot. We're going to re-put in the magnet, tighten it up with the key which comes with the MagnaCleanse. So it's going to give them both a nip up. Now because I've pre-filled this system I can now open these two valves to allow water into the pots and the flow comes back into the MagnaClean at the bottom so I can now just bleed all the air out of these two pots so I know they're full and um, we're nearly ready for doing the MagnaCleanse. So that's the air all out of the system and we're now ready to start. Adding the cleaning chemicals to the power flush machine is done at a different time to that of the magna cleanse. Whereas the magna cleanse is done right at the beginning, in the power flushing, you would do this after you'd flush the system a couple of times going backwards and forwards. But you still put it into the machine. Now when it comes to the radiators, magna clean give you this radiator agitator which you put into an SDS drill. And you put the SDS drill on hammer. Sounds a bit weird but there you go. So we've got the radiator flow and return valves open for this radiator and we're going to agitate the bottom of the radiator. Now we only do across the bottom and we don't go across the fins because that could snap the agitator. So we're just going to go right on the bottom of the radiator and we just go across the bottom all the way along 
and what this will do is it will release all the magnetite which is stuck at the bottom I guess you could do this when you're uh, power flushing but this is what you get with the magna cleanse and if you didn't want to use the agitator you could also use the old tried and tested method of using a rubber mallet now not every central heating system will require magna cleansing or power flushing but most of them will require a chemical clean and I always find it best to actually check the water quality when you're out doing the survey when you're off to price the job now next thing what we might have to have a look at while we are doing a survey is to see whether the gas pipe needs increasing or not what we're up against we've got 15 mil pipe and I'm going to show you the route and it goes up into the bedroom so let's go in the bedroom. So this is where it comes up from downstairs and runs across here. And it then runs across one bedroom. So this is the bedroom on the other side of the wall. So it now runs across here and then goes through the extension outside right to the other end and feeds a boiler, well a 30 kilowatt boiler and freestanding cooker. So I think we can safely say we need a new gas run. As you can see on this installation we actually had to increase the gas pipe to 28 millimeters because of the length of the run going from the front room all the way to the boiler in the kitchen extension. Now when it comes to sizing a gas pipe, there's a lot involved in that for gas engineers and I've done a full video on sizing gas pipes and I will leave a link in the description below if you want to watch that video. But gas engineers also have things like apps to help them do this process more quickly and more efficiently. But if your gas engineer isn't checking your gas pipe before your new boiler is installed, then you might not be getting enough gas going to the boiler to make it work correctly. And now it's finally actually time to do a bit of boilering. So let's get on with it. At least the flue is easy to remove because it's not sealed. Now to get the boiler out, first of all you've got to disconnect all these nuts here that connect all the pipes to the boiler. But one thing you don't forget, if you can see it here, is the flexi tube which goes to the expansion vessel which goes in here. So you pull that clip out and pull that out because otherwise you can't lift the boiler off the back uh, jig. Now the boiler's off the wall, all we've got to do now is undo these pipes here and then we can take the jig off. Now what did we do before we had wet vax? And there she is, the old girl, where she belongs, on the grass. May she rest in pieces. Now the boiler's out of the way, I can get all these pipes marked up which I'm going to be keeping and then remove the rest of them. Now, to get the bracket in the right place, what I do is I cut a hole out in the template, slide the flue through the hole, and then I can mark the center hole there, drill that, put my bracket on, level my bracket up, mark the other holes and drill them. So that's the way I make sure the bracket is in the right place. That's the boiler on the wall. All the pipes valved off ready. All I've got to do now is, Get it all piped up under here. <laughs> so that's most of the pipe work done now. All I've got left to do is the condensate, the pressure relief valve discharge pipe, the flow of the commissioning, the controls, the flushing, the cleaning, the insulation of the pipe work. Still lots to do. Well, that's the flue sealed on the outside and it's now sealed on the inside. Now everything is piped up. The only thing what I've got missing is 
the plumber's merchants didn't give me the connector I wanted for there so it's uh, open at the moment but it will be closed so you can see the filter from Trapex and the air separator also from Trapex so all the pipe works done all I've got to do now is commission the thing and get it up and running once I've commissioned it and I'm happy with everything oh I still need to seal uh, the gas pipe coming through there and once I'm happy with all this I can get it liked after I've commissioned it now there's two hours of my life I'm never going to get back lagging the pipes So now while the pipe work's completed, what we need to do is fill up with water and check for any leaks. And also we need to carry out another tightness test to make sure that our new gas pipe is not leaking. Now after any successful tightness test, we now need to purge the system of air. So we need to get rid of this 5-15% to gas in air so we don't get an explosion. So the only appliance we're looking at is this boiler. This is the only boiler, it's the only thing connected to this gas supply. We've no cooker to purge from, so we're gonna to have to purge from the boiler. So let's get purging. Now if you want to know the full purge procedure and how to work out purge volumes, why don't you have a look at our video on purging on our channel? But you see you need to open the windows, ventilate the room first. We need to take our first reading from the gas meter so you can see it's 0.55 nearly well halfway between the zero and the one so we need to go to the bottom underneath the boiler now onto the gas connection and just undo the uh, knot at the back of the gas supply and we need to purge this minimum volume of 0.01 meters cubed or 10 decimeters cubed so once we've done that, you can see the final reading now is uh, 0.56, just over the 2. So that's the 0 0.01 meters cubed, or the 10 decimeters cubed. So we're just going to re-tighten up the knot now. We've passed that minimum volume. Make sure we tighten it up correctly. But after we've purged, because we're not going to be doing another tightness test, we need to make sure we spray the joint with leak detection fluid, LDF, and wait for at least 15-20 seconds before we wipe the excess off. After a successful tightness test we've purged, after a successful purge, we can now take our standing pressure. And at the moment, my standing pressure is reading 26.5. So 26.50 millibars. So that's what my standing pressure is reading. So after I've done my standing pressure, I can now do my working pressure at the meter. So let's get on with that. Now the next test we're going to be carrying out is the working pressure of the gas appliance at the gas meter. Now this procedure or these figures have just changed. Now it used to be 21 millibars plus or minus two millibars which was 19 to 23 millibars working pressure at the meter. But iGEM have changed their document. iGEM G13 to tell us all about it. So what it is now is we have a minimum of 18.5 millibars to a maximum of 23 millibars. But how are we going to test it? Now, what I've got connected to this U6 Imperial uh, gas meter here is this combi boiler and a hob which is just to the back of you. There's another boiler as well, but we'll, we'll, we'll pretend we haven't got that. Now, what we have to do is we have to put this boiler on high fire or service mode or uh, sweep mode, whichever one it is, and we have to put the hob onto 50%. Now, if whatever gas appliances you've got in a house to get these readings, you will need to make sure you put the biggest appliance on maximum, and then the rest of the appliances on that gas meter at 50%. Now, these are the tests that Caden are going to do with their engineers, to check and see if we've got this 18.5 millibars. I've got the digital manometer connected and it's showing 21, 22 millibars working pressure at the meter with this just running at central heating. 
So let's get it on high fire. Now the boiler's in chimney sweep mode. We've now got 20.8, flicking around 20.9 now. Millibars working pressure at the meter with just the boiler on chimney sweep mode. Let's go and put the hob on 50% load. Now this hob is a four burner hob. These are two kilowatts each. This is three kilowatts. This is a kilowatt. So I'm going to put these two front ones on. And that will give me my 50% load. One minute later. So now I've got the hob on 50% load. This is still on chimney sweep mode and we've got 20.7 millibars working pressure at this U6 gas meter. Now we've finished with the um, manometer at the actual gas meter. We can now put the test nipple back. We can now tighten it up. But remember, don't over tighten it guys. You can split the barrel of the test nipple and then because we've not uh, able to test this, we need to now test it with leak detection fluid. No, I never turned the gas off all the time I was doing this, so I never allowed air back into the system. And after we've used our leak detection fluid, we can now wipe off the excess after 15, 20 seconds to make sure we don't leave it. To corrode the meter. Now for the part of the installation that actually takes the longest, which is the commissioning of the appliance. Now let's get to the tap and let's start this commissioning procedure to the manufacturer's instructions and the benchmark. Now while we're at the tap, there's a few tests we can do now before we move on to the boiler itself. First of all, for the benchmark book, we need to know what our hot water temperature is, what our flow rate of our hot water is, and what our incoming water supply is so we can work out the delta T. So what we need to do now is, first of all, I need to get my cold water temperature. So I'm just going to turn the tap onto the cold. I'm going to open the tap now onto its full rate. And now using my thermometer, I can now take my cold water temperature and see what it comes out at. So I'm getting a stable reading of 10.2 degrees centigrade. So this boiler is giving me a hot water temperature at flow rate of 10.5 litres, around about 10.5 litres at 40.3 degrees C. The next test I'm going to do now is our inlet pressures. So I'm just going to undo the inlet test point on this boiler, which is down at the bottom here. Okay, so I can hear the gas coming out and I'm just going to put it onto the test nipple. I can get this out of the way now. I'm just going to stick it on the side of the boiler. So it's saying, our, given our standing pressure now of 25.4. In the benchmark book, it says working pressure at the appliance in hot water and heating, not high and low. High and low setting is for fluid gas analyzing. So some guys do it on high and low, but the benchmark book's asking for it on hot water and heating, so what it's actually getting. Other boilers have a test point actually at the boiler. So where it comes in, at the gas isolation valve. And we should have no more than a one millibar difference between our working pressure at the meter and working pressure at the appliance. Now, Ariston don't give us that inlet test point, but what they do say is at the gas valve, in hot water and heating, it cannot go lower than 17.5 millibars. And that's from the manufacturers, and that's in the manufacturer's manual as well. So what we're gonna do is, first of all, I'm gonna put it on hot water, so I'm gonna turn the tap on. You can hear I've got the hot tap running, and this boiler has now got an inlet pressure of 20.43. So that is our working pressure at the gas valve on hot water with the tap running at maximum. Let's try the central heating. Now you can hear the boiler is now in central heating mode. It is giving me an inlet working pressure 
I have 22.2936, so it's slowly modulating around as it's going around. So that would be our inlet working pressure. Remember, it can go down to 17.5, what it's saying in the manufacturers. We're well in because we've got 22.41 now. So that is the working pressure at the gas valve with the central heating on. And both hot water and central heating, I put them on to maximum on the temperature setting on the front of the boiler. So this is what its maximum would be. And don't forget, once you've finished, remove your test uh, hose, tighten back up your test nipple. Don't go too tight, you don't want to be snapping it. And then make sure you spray with LDF. see whether your test nipple is leaking or not obviously it'll bubble up so we're going to be gas rating we're going to gas rate on hot water and central heating central heating is going to be on maximum hot water is going to be on maximum now if you want to see a more full in-depth um, video on, on uh, gas rating go on to our channel and have a look at that it gas rates with a u6 and a g4 and all the other smart meters we've got a g4 meter so let's quickly go through that First thing I'm going to do is turn the tap on because we're going to gas rate hot water first. The next thing is I'm going to wait till I get to a full figure before I start the stopwatch. And now I'm going to wait two minutes and take my second reading. So we're coming up to our two minutes. And let's take our second reading. Let's gas rate central heating. Now, what you don't want to be doing on your central heating is start gas rating as soon as you turn that boiler on. Because that will just give you your maximum on central heating load. You need the boiler to work a little bit to give you your actual load for the heating. You need to run it for about five minutes before you start doing your gas rating. Just to give that boiler enough time to go, oh, right, okay, this is what I can do, but I only need to do this. And that give you some idea, so if you wanted to uh, range rate the boiler, you could do. So again, first thing we're going to do is wait till we get a full figure, start the stopwatch, time for two minutes, take our second figure, and then let's go and do the mass. So we'll start with the hot water. Our first reading was 0 0.030, and our second reading was 0 0.115. You take the 115 or the 030 away from each other, you get 0 0.085, but that's meters cubed for two minutes. So we need to give us times it by 30 to give us the meters cubed an hour. So we've got 2.55 meters cubed an hour, which equals 27.41 kilowatts gross or 24.69 kilowatts net. So we need to look in the manufacturer's instructions to see whether that's correct or not. Look at the central heating. First reading was 0 0.200. Second reading was 0 0.235. Take one from the other, you get 0 0.035. Times that by 30 gives you 1.05 meters cubed an hour, which gives us 11.28 kilowatts gross and 10.16 kilowatts net. We can now check with the manufacturer's instructions to see whether our gas rate is correct and what we're looking for. Now, next test. I've got the, uh, the DC710 with my K probes for doing the temperature. So this is our flow pipe, this is our return pipe. I've got them clamped as close as I can get them to the boiler. Now the boiler's been running for well, at least 10-15 minutes now and you can see that by the temperature because our flow temperature is 72.4 and our return temperature is 61.9 so we've got a temperature difference of 10.7. Now the things with the temperatures, we don't want less than 10 degrees and we don't want more than 20 degrees for a condensing boiler. Well, less than 10 degrees coming back to the boiler, then you know, you've know you got it whipping around something really quick and it's not gonna be in condensing mode. The other thing as well is, if the return temperature is over 55 degrees, it won't be in condensing mode anyway. And the boiler should always try and get into this, the return temperature of being less than 55 degrees. Weather comp helps this massively 
stopping the boiler going up into temperature too quickly. This hasn't got weather comp on it, but it's got no controls on it at the moment. <laughs> but we'll talk about controls when we get there. So at the moment we've got 74 on the flow, 63.3 on the return with a 10.6 uh, degree temperature difference. So we would put putting that on our flow and return temperatures. I always wait till we try and get to the, the maximum flow temperature for this boiler to make sure we've got this uh, no less than 10 and no more than 20. Uh, this is only a ver on a very, very small system. There's only four radiators on being fed from this boiler and they're only very small anyway. This is why we've got this only a, a 10 degree difference. If it were on a bigger system, it would be a different story. Now, while I'm down here, I might as well check the flame rectification on this boiler, so the flame supervision device. So, as you can see in here, the boiler is running on central heating. So what I'm going to do now is, I'm just going to turn off the gas supply, and what the boiler should do is, the boiler should go into lockout. So, let's have a go. So it's saying SP3 on the front. Trying to ignite. So that was the first attempt. It's now saying SP1. And it's trying to ignite. So that's the second attempt. It's now saying SP2. And it's trying to light again. It's now saying reset 501. So what I need to do now is turn the gas supply back on. Press and hold the reset button. And it's now back up. So let's see if it lights up. And away it goes. So that's checking flame rectification or the flame supervision device for this condensing combi boiler. Benchmark now says about balancing radiators. There's, you'll see loads of guys will see on the internet or you start at the closest um, radiator to the boiler and you screw it all the way down and then you turn it back one turn and then you go to the next radiator in the line turn it all the way down and turn it back two and go along the system like that but the best way of doing it is by actually setting the valves up by using your analyzer or a thermometer to make sure you've got about 10 degrees now I've got a flow on this here of 61.8 and I've got a return of 51.9. the moment I've got a 9.9 .9 degree difference. I've set this radiator up to have a 10 degree difference across the flow and return. If it's now 10.1 look. So at the moment I have got a flow temperature 61.9. I've got a return temperature of 52, so I've got 9.9 .9 degrees C difference. Let's talk about condensate dispersal. So the condensate drain. This is where we've had some big changes over the last year or so. Basically the benchmark doesn't want us to be running condensate pipes outside because of freezing. And if we do run them outside, then we have to follow the manufacturer's instructions and the building regulations. And basically we need to insulate the condensate pipe going outside there. And it can only be 32 mil as a minimum. It can be bigger, but it can only be a minimum of 32 mil. So we're not running an um, overflow pipe outside now. Now, so we need to run it internally wherever we can. And it says only run it externally if it's impractical to run it internally. So we've got two different ways of doing it here. So we'll have a look at this first. Now this has got the pressure relief and the condensate going into an internal trap, an internal waste pipe. So this is on push fit because it's got the blow off going into there. But the blow off has got a tub dish there. So it's an air break and you can see it actually would be running through there. So if it was dispersing the water, you would see it. And then this condensate line's going into the same pipe. Is it legal or is it not legal? Well, it'd be better if they were run separately, like this one is. So the way this one's run is, again, it comes down into the waste pipe. Again, it's into push fit. But this time, 
we're using what's called a Tesla trap. So this Tesla trap, it's not made by the car manufacturers, it's Tesla UK, you make cook and stuff like that. So what they do is, uh, it's got uh, no return valve in it. So this could be connected to a soil stack and uh, you won't get any smells coming back. But one of the biggest problems we have is some manufacturers say they want an air brake in this pipe. So if you do connect it to a soil stack, are you going to do that then? Anyway, follow the manufacturer's instructions on um, the boilers for all the condensate dispersal and obviously the building regulations. But according to the benchmark book now, it says don't run it out externally unless there's no other option of running it internally. But if you do, we must insulate it. Now, next thing is flue gas analyzer. So we're gonna analyze this boiler. So we're gonna do maximum, minimum. We're also gonna do our flue integrity test. So first thing you need to do is remove the test point on the top of the boiler. The next thing you need to do is set the get depth gauge for the analyzer, about 100, 150 mil. If you want to see how I fully go through flue gas analyzing and how to understand the results, I've done a series of videos on using flue gas analyzers, understanding the results. So have a check them out. Here we go. And I need to put this boiler now into minimum setting. So go down to the bottom, press the reset button and hold it in till it comes up with test. Then I need to use, press the minimum button till it comes up with the tap and the central heating and that will now put me in minimum test mode. Okay, so I've started the pump on the analyzer via my app. At the moment we have a carbon monoxide of zero, a carbon dioxide of 8.5, a ratio of zero, oxygen of 6%, excessive air 39% with a flue temperature of 70 degrees. So that's pretty much what I've got for minimum. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to put it in maximum. So to put it in maximum route mode I need to press the plus button until just the tap comes on. And this now should send it into maximum mode for me. So because my system is so <laughs> small it's locking out on maximum mode straight away. So I've had to open the tap so I can get rid of some heat out of the heat exchanger to allow it to go into maximum mode because there's only four rats on this system. At the moment I've got a CO of 61, um, gone up to 62 now, carbon dioxide of 8.6, a ratio of 0 0.0007, Oxygen of 5.7, excessive air 38%, temperature 61.9. So that's basically what we're getting. You shouldn't have to alter this on a brand new boiler. So just be aware guys, uh, don't start adjusting it just for the fun of it. Okay, watch my video, explains it a lot more. So that's flue gas analyzing, what we need to do. Let's have a look at flue integrity. First thing I need to do is change the probe over. So I need to adjust the stop and slide it into the boiler. I've left it on maximum because I'm in that setting now. We'll see what we get. And what we're looking for is a, an oxygen reading of more than 20.6 with CO2 of less than 0 0.2 with no ratio. So at the moment I've got 0 ppm on carbon monoxide, I've got 0 0.2 on carbon dioxide, I've got an oxygen reading at 20.6, okay, so that's on maximum, let's put it on minimum. So on minimum I've got carbon monoxide 0, carbon dioxide 0, no ratio, an oxygen level of 20.9. So that's our flue integrity. Now, according to the standards, every boiler now has to have some kind of magnetic filter fitted to it. It also needs to be, during the commissioning process, be completely cleaned. You must make sure you put inhibitor into the system to inhibit corrosion. Two dissimilar metals in the system will create electrolysis, it will create corrosion. Also, if you're getting air dragged into the system, that will also create corrosion. So we need to inhibit the corrosion 
by installing this stuff and this will need to be checked annually on the service as well. Magnetic filters are coming incredibly important now and the regulations are now saying we should be installing these. Loads of different filters on the market at the moment. Some manufacturers even put their names on filters and give you a higher warranty. So whichever boiler you're fitting, fit the correct filter for that boiler. Now, as you've just seen, the actual commissioning of the boiler takes forever to do, and it's incredibly important that it's done correctly. Now, in every boiler manufacturer's instructions, there is the benchmark book to be able to fill all these readings in. Now, if your engineer does not fill the readings into this book, there is a chance that the manufacturer of the boiler won't carry out the warranty work on said boiler. So it's incredibly important that this is filled in or the engineer can do it online or they can even do it with an app and they give you a copy of it so you can stick it into the book. So if a repair engineer from the manufacturer comes around to fix the boiler, they know it's been commissioned correctly. Now the next part of this video seems to be causing quite a few problems with the general public on quite a few of my other videos and that is about checking the radiator sizes in the house to see if you can have a flow temperature of 55 degrees which is going to help you save energy, save gas and save that money. A lot of comments have been, I'm not paying for a new boiler and having all my radiators and pipe work ripped out. That's not what I said in the videos. Basically, what an engineer should do is see if they can, once they've installed the new boiler, that they can get the flow temperature down as low as possible. Now, most radiators and most central heating systems in the UK are sized with a flow temperature of 75 degrees, which is way too hot for the boiler and which stops the boiler being efficient. Now, if our return temperature is greater than 55 degrees, then the boiler won't be condensing and won't be saving you any money. Basically, what you've got to do, or what the engineer has to do, is size the radiators and use a conversion factor to see if the flow temperature can be reduced as much as possible from 75 to 55. Now the engineer might find out that yes, the radiators have been massively oversized and the heating system flow temperature can be reduced. But if they find no, they cannot reduce the flow temperature because of factors like the radiators are too small or the pipe works too small to actually feed the water to the radiators to give this heat output then they just need to notify you with that and then it's up to you to see whether you can afford to have it all ripped out and replaced but if you're having a complete new central heating system we need to comply with part l of the building regs and then we will have to have a maximum of 55 degrees Hopefully that's cleared up all the comments I've been getting on the videos. Probably hasn't though, has it? Anyway, let's have a look now and see how we do check these radiators to see if we can have this flow temperature of 55 degrees. Now, I have just spent another hour sizing all the radiators in my house to see if they will work on this flow uh, temperature of 55 degrees. So we're in the kitchen dining room, we'll start here, and the radiator's just here. Now, this room with a flow rate of 55 degrees requires 5,353 BTUs. This radiator, I'm giving out with the correction factor for, this radiator was set up for a uh, flow rate of 75 degrees, was 4,262 so it doesn't work. Now, our master bedroom, which is just here. Again, we require 2,863 BTUs, but the radiator with the correction factor gives us 2,130. So that doesn't work neither. Now, bedroom number three, which is down there, the spare bedroom, that 
requires 1,986 BTUs and the radiator with the correction factor gives us 1,446. So that'll work. Will's bedroom, where the boiler is, that requires 2,561 and that radiator gives us 1,826. So that don't work neither. Now our dressing room, which is in here with the bedroom, we require 1,181 BTUs, but the radiator gives us 1,522. So one radiator so far, I don't need to change. The living room, uh, it's quite a big living room, and that requires 3,913 BTUs. But we've got two radiators in there, and those radiators together and minus in the correction factor gives us 4,826. So that's spot on. And the hallway, which is between Will's bedroom, the bathroom, and the spare bedroom, it requires 1,489 BTUs. And the radiator with the correction factor gives us 1,826 BTUs. Now, the, the boiler's been running a while, and I said to my wife, which rooms do you think are not getting warm enough? And she was absolutely spot on. She knew every room which wasn't getting warm enough. So, I'm going to need to change this radiator here. I'm going to need to change the radiator in our bedroom, the radiator in Will's bedroom, the radiator in the spare bedroom, and the two towel rads we've got, one in the ensuite and one in the master bathroom, don't get it hot neither. So they're going to need to be changed. So just racking up to somebody's house, changing the boiler, and then going away with a flow rate of 55 degrees doesn't always work. Now part L of the building reg says try when you're just changing the boiler, Try and get the flow rate to 55 degrees. If you can't get to 55 degrees, then adjust the boiler if the radiators can't be changed. Now, let's have a really quick look at controls. Because this video is just going on. Right, first thing is, because of Boiler Plus, we have to make sure that our stat is Boiler Plus compatible. Because every combi boiler, so we've been looking at combi boiler, needs a room stat and it needs a time clock. So however you do that, whichever way you want to do it. But I would always advise, use the manufacturer's controls because they will make the boiler work at its optimum. So the two boilers I've got to the, behind me and the side of me, one's working off an internet control. So this is the internet control here. Uh, the other one is working off this room stat. So it's got an RF room stat, but it's got weather compensation. So we've got pretty much everything set up here for Ariston training. So whatever, you know, they want to do with the boilers. So always fit controls to Boiler Plus and always try and fit the manufacturer's controls because it will make it so much easier for installing and it will make the boiler work a lot better. Now, hopefully this incredibly long video has actually helped you realise exactly what goes into installing a combination boiler. It's not a half a day job anymore, it's actually a day and a half, two day job. Now, there are a load of amazing gas engineers out there who will install boilers to manufacturer's instructions and to all the building regulations and do an absolutely amazing job for a great price. But there are also a lot of pretend engineers out there who will do an absolute poop job for a cheap price. So just be aware of that. If it seems too good to be true, it probably is. Just remember, an engineer to install a boiler must be gas safe registered and be competent to work on boilers. That means they must hold the qualification SEMWAT, CPA1 and CCM1 to be able to work on them. And they will register the boiler via gas safe or the manufacturers to building control and you will receive a building control certificate within 28 days of installing the boiler. Now only qualified engineers are able to register via gas safe and building control. So once you get that certificate, you must keep it safe because if you sell your house 
then the solicitors will expect that certificate to give to the new owners of the house. It will go in the homeowners pack. So hopefully you've got something from the video. Hopefully you've enjoyed it and I'll catch you on the next one guys. Cheers.